gives me great pleasure now to, to welcome up onto the stage uh, Chris Graydon. Would you like to come on up, Chris? So, um, when our next speaker got his current job last September, I wrote a blog which argued that the financial and practical practical constraints of his new position meant there was little room for radical new thinking. I don't know if you read it. Um, well, <laughs> I don't think you did, actually, because he quickly proved me wrong. Uh, within weeks, uh, Chris Grayling just puts, frankly, rocket boosters under the rehabilitation revolution. Uh, the, re the pilots, as we've been discussing, uh, were quickly uh, cancelled, many of them. Uh, the department wasn't going to wait around. They were just going to do it. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, to explain how he intends to just do it, uh, the uh, Secretary of State for Justice, Chris Grayling. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to be here at this event organised by Policy Exchange. It is a think tank that has made a very real contribution to conservative thinking. The most recent report is another useful example of that. Uh, and I think we've seen in that report some of the most considered in-depth analysis of the issue that I have seen. Now, I think it's worth starting by saying, at a time when the political situation domestically is, to say the least, lively, um, I think it's worth pausing to say a little bit about what we're actually doing. We are, as a government, delivering a social revolution. We're transforming our schools. We are delivering the biggest changes to our welfare state since it was created in the 1940s. We are working to turn around the lives of the most troubled families. These are things that are happening now as I speak. But there is one key part of the social challenge which I don't think has yet progressed nearly far enough. We have a seemingly endless spiral of reoffending in this country. People from the most difficult backgrounds, slipping into crime in their teenage years, going round and round the criminal justice system, offending and reoffending. The conveyor belt to crime, the revolving door, whatever we tag it, it is a cycle we have to break. When Labour was in power, Reoffending barely changed. By the time they left office, it was rising again. Nearly half of released prisoners reoffend within a year. We're seeing the same faces turn up at the prison gates time and time again. In fact, I ask prison officers if they have their regulars, and they always say yes. One in three offenders is prolific, which means they have 15 or more convictions or cautions to their name. I am determined to change the way we rehabilitate, we rehabilitate offenders so that all of this starts to change. It's been a week since we finished consulting on our proposals for the way rehabilitation should be delivered in England and Wales. We're now looking and listening to refine our approach and to get it right. We'll bring forward details of the next stage of our plans before too long. But today, I want to talk in particular about the approach we are taking to the overall delivery of that change. The way we want to transform rehabilitation will be the next stage of bringing the payment by results approach to government. We are delivering a clear coalition promise, backed up recently by the Prime Minister. It is founded on the basic premise we accept in every other walk of life, that you only get paid for what you deliver. Payment by results makes sense as a way of improving effectiveness and getting a good deal for the taxpayer. Now, we are a reforming government. We are driving real change. But when that is set against the backdrop of severe financial constraints that Mark made reference to, we have to secure a good deal for the taxpayer, and we've got to be innovative. Now, payment by results is not rocket science. It's not some great newfangled methodology. It's what we do in almost all of our daily transactions paying for a service delivered. It's about harnessing what works. It's about giving freedom to the external organizations and professionals who deliver services for us, whether they're private sector and voluntary sector providers, giving them the freedom to innovate and compete. It's a very simple concept. I will give you the freedom to get on with the job in the way you see best. Gone will be the diktats and bureaucracies of Whitehall. But in return, you have to accept that I will only pay you in full when you succeed. It's a way of getting results that we pledged in the coalition agreement that we would bring in. It's something that I believe will become the norm for many parts of government delivery in the future. It won't work everywhere, but it can work in many places. And first and foremost, it is common sense. Now, in my time at the Department for Work and Pensions, I was responsible for building this country's first major payment-by-results system, the Work Programme. 
to get the long-term unemployed back to work. There's been a lot of debate about it in recent weeks, so let me be clear. The work programme is getting people off benefits and into work. It had a slow start because it began against a much more difficult economic background than we'd expected and the OBR had forecast. But it is meeting its objectives in getting people off benefits. Over half of people who joined the work programme in June 2011 had spent at least some time off benefits over the first 12 months of the programme. One in five of them had spent at least half the year off benefits, and that's halfway through a two-year programme. It's also getting people into real jobs. According to industry figures, 200,000 long-term unemployed people have started work since they joined the work programme. And it's proving much better value for the taxpayer. The last government toyed with payment by results, but never actually really did it. They bottled out, and they left in place expensive systems that created no risk and little incentive for the providers. The schemes we inherited from Labour were hugely expensive. Under the flexible New Deal, which I scrapped on taking office, we were paying out around £1,500 for every person who joined the scheme, before they even did a day's work. We've cut that cost by almost three quarters already, and by next year the work programme will be 100% payment by results. It is simple. Under this government, if providers don't get people into work and don't deliver for the taxpayer, they will not be paid. The industry itself estimates that the work programme is delivering much better value for money for the taxpayer than any comparable programme in the last 20 years. Where the New Deal was costing the taxpayer £7,500 per job, the work programme is just costing 2100 The Labour Party never took the bold steps that we have, but they always said they supported the concept. Both Liam Byrne and Douglas Alexander said it was the right way forward. Sadly, that is no longer true. The Public Accounts Committee has an enormously important role in securing the best value for the taxpayer. But Margaret Hodge, it seems to me, is playing politics with her attacks on payment by results whenever she can. In the case of the work programme, that has been particularly ironic. She's wasted no time in bashing and misrepresenting its credentials. But the reality is that under the last government, she was employment minister. She was one of the ministers who handed over those millions and millions of pounds of taxpayers' money to private companies without any significant measure of success or transparency. It is madness for her to now claim that payment by results, a clear mechanism whereby providers put their own money at risk before they de demonstrate an agreed measure of success, delivers a worse performance than the black hole the previous government presided over. What on earth could she possibly want instead? Payment for failure? Payment for the status quo? What we're doing is delivering a much better deal for the taxpayer in tough times economically. We need big solutions because the problems are big. And of course, when you talk about payment for results, it's not just about value for the taxpayer, it's delivering real social change. And offering that level of professional freedom as well gives providers the ability to innovate, to chase new solutions, to come up with the best possible ways of helping those offenders. And many of the underlying issues in those offenders' lives are all too familiar to all of us in this room. Drug misuse, alcoholism, abusive relationships, educational failure and worklessness. Solving those problems is never going to be simple. It's going to require bold, radical solutions for the long term. We need to act with scale and ambition, and we need to act now. Because the cost of not acting doesn't bear thinking about. And the system is not paying its way. The National Audit Office puts the cost of reoffending by recent ex-prisoners at between nine and a half and thirteen billion pounds. No sensible investor would accept such a bad return. I don't see why the British taxpayer should. What I'm hearing directly from ex-offenders is that they want to turn their lives around, but often simply don't know how. I've already said these people are facing a huge range of challenges. Often, and actually the most scary statistic that I've come across since becoming Secretary of State is that a quarter of the people in our prisons were in care as children, which is truly shocking. These are people who don't know how to get their lives back together again. What they need is support to sort themselves out. Now, rehabilitation begins on the inside. A lot is already being done in prisons to ensure that offenders aren't just sitting in their cells in a state of enforced idleness. 
In some prisons, we've now got to a regular working week of 40 hours plus. There's 11.4 million man hours worked in prisons in 2011-12, and that number is rising all the time. It's not about breaking rocks or any of those traditional things. It's about giving meaningful work to prisoners, instilling discipline and imposing structure on the chaos. It's about turning an offender into somebody who is gainfully employed and ultimately becomes a taxpayer themselves. But that can't just end at the gate. The duty of care extends from the inside to the outside, and the two have to be properly joined up, especially for those who are serving those short sentences of under 12 months. And my vision for that outside is simple. What I want to see is someone to meet the offender at the gate, someone who can act as a guide, somebody who's already got to know them while they're still in prison. Might be a volunteer, an ex-gang member, a former prisoner who's been through the system, someone best placed to get an offender practical support, to provide a mentoring support to them and get them back onto the straight and narrow. Now, part of that is, of course, getting offenders access to skills and access to work. It's an important point. Nearly half of offenders weren't in work in the year leading up to their conviction. One in ten offenders has never worked. We need to help get people to employment and help them stay there, and the work programme is playing an important part in that. So how precisely does the vision I've set out become a reality? Well, I've been being pressured by the other side for detailed evidence of how it will all work and how it will make a difference. Let me take that one head on. The last government's approach was to pilot everything and do very little. And when they did something, they made it so complex and bureaucratic that they turned committed professionals into slavish box tickers. We are going to do things very differently in criminal justice. I'm not going to put in place some form of new textbook for the rehabilitation of offenders. I'm not going to put in place the kind of micromanagement that lay, in the heart, lay at the heart of the last government's years in office. I'm getting rid of the bureaucratic systems that our probation system currently has to deal with. And I do not believe that you need to pilot professional and operational freedom. As with the work programme, our rehabilitation revolution will offer real flexibility. It is for the frontline providers, private voluntary organisations, working together with the public sector, uh, those with unique skills and expertise to help turn offenders' lives around. Now, of course, what's different between this and the work programme <laughs> is there's still a firm, clear job to be done in meeting the orders of the court. And we also have to make sure that public safety is paramount. But within those parameters, there should be freedom for providers to innovate, to try new things, and to deliver a reduction in reoffending. We will expect bidders who take over the delivery of rehabilitation support to offenders to put some of their own money on the table. And then we need to see the results. I want to see reoffending rates falling year on year. I've already talked about the unacceptable costs of reoffending financially, but we have to remember the horrendous impact it has on the lives of victims uh, and indeed of the families of those who offend themselves. We will only pay for what works. We need to see reconviction rates fall, and that's the basis on which providers will be paid. What this does is simply hold providers to account for what they deliver. That's all, nothing more and nothing less. And I can't see how that wouldn't be welcomed by anyone who cares about how the taxpayer's money gets spent. Now, right at the heart of my vision are partnerships between different sectors. Uh, and we've seen the different sectors all present at this conference. That's what opening up this market can achieve. Different players bringing their own strengths to the table and harnessing these to deliver results and bring costs down. Of course, there will always be a crucial role for the public sector, but there's also a role for the voluntary and private sectors. Each has a skill to bring to bear in this. I want to leverage the best of those skills from each of those three sectors to the task of bringing down offending. We need to bring together those strengths to keep the public safe, to innovate in delivering a service, and to find creative ways of turning lives around. But again, I'm not handing out free lunches. All organisations, including in the social sector, will have to show they can deliver with a credible business case. What I do want to create is the right environment for all competitors, all organisations to flourish and thrive, including small voluntary organisations. This is not going to be just a game for the big players. 
We are providing a grant to support voluntary organisations to engage in our reforms. And I'm keen to see partnerships forged between voluntary organisations, between private and voluntary providers, and for these partnerships to come forward to compete for contra contracts. Smaller organisations will also be able to work as subcontractors to larger providers, and we will take even tougher steps than we did on the work programme to make sure they are treated fairly. I think of particular importance, though, is the social investment sector. I think for the social investment sector, this is by far the biggest show in town. It has a key role to play here. It sees the delivery of rehabilitation services as a major opportunity. And I want to see social investment firms help social organisations, voluntary sector organisations, put together credible bids in their own right, and also to help them form appropriate partnerships with the private sector. I also want the social investment sector to be there to provide an opportunity for our existing staff uh, in probation trusts to find routes towards creating their own social enterprises, to mutualising the structures that are already there, uh, and we're providing support to do that uh, through the Cabinet Office. I think there's a real opportunity for our existing teams to be a part of an exciting future uh, and for them to work with social investment firms and indeed other partners to find their way into that future. All this means that providers, whatever their size, with good innovative ideas and a solid business case, will, be within a will have a chance to participate. So on the back of our recent consultation and the responses we're analysing, the job now for my department and myself, this year and next, is to set the conditions for the world I've described. A world where reoffending starts to come down again and offenders are put on the right track and where particularly we start to get to grips with that under 12 month group who've had no support at all, except in very sporadic cases up to now. Now as with the work programme, I will not pretend that we're going to see dramatic results overnight. The difficult challenges faced by a group of repeat offenders can't just be wished away. It will take the talent, creativity and energy of providers in all three sectors, working on the understanding that they will be held to account for their performance in getting offenders back onto the straight and narrow. So that's the problem. That's what I believe the solution looks like. And I'm very clear that what I want to see is an incremental year-by-year -year reduction in reoffending over the next decade. There will be some tough decisions for us over the coming months in how we deliver that change. We have to lead a team of good quality professionals through that change. It will, I think, create enormous opportunities for everyone in the probation world. But ultimately, this has to be about doing the right thing for our society, for the taxpayer, for those working hard in the system, and for the victims of crime. And if we get it right, we can make a transformational difference to this country. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Chris. And um, we're going to take lots of questions, I'm sure, from the floor in a, in a moment. I've got a couple quick ones yep. first. Um, we, we've discussed a lot uh, during the early part of today, um, mentors, mm -hmm. um, and it's obviously key to uh, your vision. You talked about someone to meet the offender at the gate and you suggested that might be a, a volunteer. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of discussion here as to exactly what, what that mentor will be. I mean, uh, you obviously got private sector companies perhaps delivering something. If you've then got a volunteer, volunteer mentor whose job is, yeah. I don't know, who's training them? Uh, what, why shouldn't they be paid? After all, the, the company itself is being, being paid. Can you just sort of fill in some of the, the gaps in your mind? Who are all these mentors? Where are they going to come from? How many do you need? Okay, I think, uh, first of all, I don't want to be prescriptive. I don't want to say to those organisations coming along, this is how you will do it. So I'm not I excluding or including any particular possibility. The kind of people I want to see brought in to, to reinforce this world, I mean, I've described as the old lad gone straight. Uh, I think the most powerful individuals when it comes to persuading a younger offender not to go back to a life of crime. As somebody who's been there, gone through it all, had all the experiences themselves, uh, and got through it to the other side. Uh, and I want to see much more of uh, the, the, the experience of those people brought to bear on this world. And, and what, but I'm not going to say to the provider, this is how you do it. I mean, if, if a provider comes along and says, there's a really good way of doing it, we've got an army of a thousand volunteers who will take one person on each, fine, if it's going to work. I think it's more likely that we will see, uh, I mean, cite a specific example. I remember seeing a, uh, a, an example in action in a charity in Scotland uh, where they had a larger-than-life 40-something former offender 
uh, who was mentoring a group of about 30 young men, uh, and I joined them for a, a, a group session. Uh, and I thought th that is a snapshot of, I think, where we can be. What we're doing in Peterborough with the pilot there, uh, the, the team that uh, are working on that pilot, we are both using the older offenders, the kinds of ones who've been in prison for a longer period of time uh, and have begun to get their heads back together again, to provide guidance to the new shorter sentence prisoners. But also many of those who've been in prison and provide that guidance within prison are going on when they leave to become mentors afterwards. There is no set rule for this. Um, it is what work, um, It literally is what works. Well, the uh, but I think it is likely to be somebody who is paid to look after a group rather hey. than an individual volunteer. That's what. That, uh, if I was running a business to this effect, that's how I would do it. But I wouldn't want to prescribe to everyone who's interested in bidding. That's how you must do it. No, no. It's just that you use the word volunteer twice, and now you've used the word paid. I, I just want to know whether you see this as a, a, a sort of a job that perhaps many of the ex-offenders coming out might aspire to. Proper salary, working so many hours a week, uh, and and developing the skills mm -hmm. through training, you know, to, to, to make it something a, a career even. Yeah. Well, we're, I mean, the, the position where we're going to start is, you know, we are not going to be tearing everything up one day and starting with something new the next. This is a process of evolution. So the the, the current probation teams, bar those who are going to remain in the, the positions of liaising with the court and doing the referrals back to court and looking after the highest risk mapper offenders. You know, on, on the day before we start and the day after we've started, the teams supporting offenders will be the same. But over time, I expect new ways of working, uh, a new approach, um, fresh faces coming in to fill vacancies, um, to change the nature of what we do so that we get more of the old lag gone straight than we've seen in the past. Okay, my other, my other brief question was just about uh, measuring success. Mm -hmm. Again, we had a debate earlier today about whether you have a sort of simple binary measure, mm -hmm. you've re-offended or you haven't, yep. or whether you make it more subtle so that the sex offender who steals a Mars bar isn't yep. a, a failure. <laughs> um, this is one of the things that we're looking at very carefully after the, the consultation. I mean, what I don't want to be is in a position where we're saying, OK, I will pay you if you reduce the number of burglaries this person commits from five to three. Um, you know, it's OK to burgle three houses, but not five. But <coughs> equally, I'm well aware that um, if we go for a purely binary approach, we may ease off some of the pressure on the volume of reoffending, the volume of offences committed. And that's something that's been raised with us by some in the consultation. So we are we're, we're thinking it through. We haven't reached a final decision. Um, I, I'm contemplating the options more in due course. It's quite important. It is, but that's why I want to take the time to get it for right. For all the people who might be bidding for a contract. Well, that's what I mean. We're not going to, you know, we will come back relatively soon okay. in the next few weeks with the next stage. But the whole point about doing the consultation at this moment in time, it would be very easy just to wait two or three more months and come up with a finalised package of proposals. I very consciously wanted to kind of lay some cards on the table, get a discussion going over precisely this kind of issue, so we could address it and kind of get and try and get it right. Uh, and I've always said, although the consultation is now over, if somebody phones up next week and say, "Hey, I've got a bright idea," we're not going to say, "Go away, the consultation's finished." Okay. This is a this is a journey of trying to get this right. All right, let's take some questions from the floor. Lady there, gentleman there. Uh, and the lady there will take the three. So the lady in the middle first. Sorry, that's irritating of me. Perhaps you should start. Can we get the microphone across quickly? Just shout. Out. Yeah, Peter, um, you've obviously gone for the idea of secure colleges, but they haven't been mentioned today. Um, and I was just wondering whether or not they are going to be part of the paid for results scheme. And if so, how are you going to give support to people who might might not have pockets of cash but do have experience. Okay, actually answer that one while the microphone goes on to the next okay. one. Um, on the secure colleges, and we, the, we're doing a different process for, for the youth offender estate. Um, effectively, the starting point is we're spending £245 million a year on detaining 1,600 young people and 70% of them re-offend. So the key question is how do we do it better and how do we do it in a more cost-effective way? And actually, um, can we focus more on education rather than simply detention. So at the moment we detain and then educate. Can we actually educate and detain? Uh, which is a change of emphasis. Uh, and what I'm doing is basically saying to the outside world, I think predominantly the education world, not exclusively, but is there a better way of doing this? If at the end of our consultation we get enough sensible ideas coming back to give me confidence that if we go to a full-scale tender process, consult come consultation about the detail, that actually there's a discussion to have. I have to either renew or replace a number of contracts for institu existing institutions over the next two or three years. And this is an opportunity to look at getting it right. Um, it is possible it could be integrated with this. 
Um, w genuinely, we are open. If a provider comes back and says, look, we'd like to do something that's joined up through into the community through with re rehabilitation, that's fine. Um, if somebody comes back and says, no, but we'll just do the institution, that's fine as well. We're really, I mean, it's, it, we're putting up a blank sheet of paper and say, how do you do this differently? Okay. Um, in terms of those people who haven't got a pot of money, uh, look, my, uh, we are not going to give contracts to people who've just got money. Um, if you are a big organization that turns up at our doorstep and says, we want to do this, and you cannot demonstrate that you've got any experience in your team of doing this, we're not going to give you a contract. So this is one where uh, it may be those who've got the money have got to seek the expertise. It may be those who've got the expertise have got to seek those who've got the money. Maybe organizations have got both. But we are absolutely not. This is not an opportunity for a big private company to emerge left field with no experience whatever in this area and say, hey, we'd like a contract. Because unless they can demonstrate to me uh, that they, they've got the skills in the team to make a difference, we will look at quality um, with great emphasis in assessing bids. This matters, we've got to get it right, and I want quality of ideas about how we evolve away from where we are at the moment to a, a world where we bring to bear the strengths of all three sectors, uh, but not in a way that jeopardizes and undermines what we're doing right now. Okay, question there. Um, uh, Alistair James from Deloitte. Um, one, one of the features, obviously, of a well-functioning market is not just the payment by results, but also the shift of market share as well as successful companies take business from less successful ones. Uh, in the work program, there is a small mechanism for market share shift within the contract, but, but a relatively small and slow one. And there are uh, terms for terminating very poorly performing mm -hmm. providers. There is very little about how anybody who is terminated, how their cohort will be picked up by others. Mm -hmm. Do you have thoughts in this contract about how to make sure uh, not only that the payment by results works, but how you actually start to see a shift towards the, the, those organizations which are proving the most successful in achieving the outcomes? Um, it's one of the things that we are looking at quite carefully. Um, it's very different to the work program uh, in the sense that the nature of what we're doing is different. Um, and of course, we've got to fulfill orders of the courts and keep things together in a fairly joined up way to ensure that we've got proper integrated management of offenders with the police. Uh, that we've got sensible mechanisms to refer people back to court. So the mechanisms we use will have to be different to the work program. I mean, in terms of the work program, um, it was always my intention when I was employment minister that if somebody lost their contract, they lost their pipeline. Um, if you can't deliver, you're missing your targets, we terminate, then we terminate. Um, and I, I don't expect that principle to be any different, um, but we haven't yet reached a final decision about what the mechanisms should be. Jeremy Wright this morning was asked about uh, what happens if, if you know if a company frankly just goes belly up. Yeah. And he said that other companies would be encouraged even at the early contract stage to say we could take this on. Is that is that the sort of mechanism you? We'll, we'll have a we'll, we'll have a takeover mechanism. I mean, it, th there are plenty of examples of government contracting areas where if a provider fails, then somebody else comes in and takes over. It might mean temporary management directly by the department while we organize that transition. It might bring, mean bringing in another provider to do a management contract for a short period of time. But there, there will be a clear mechanism for dealing with failure. OK. Um, right. G gentleman there, and then a lady right at the back. Uh, thank you. Tony Wilson from the Center for Economic and Social Inclusion. Um, uh, I agree with you, Chris. I think the work program um, so far has, has, has been far better than a lot of the coverage has suggested. And although it's early days, it's certainly been better than the PAC report last week um, suggested. Uh, however, having said that, there have been some issues. Um, you alluded to one around um, uh, the terms, if you like, particularly for smaller providers, not just in the voluntary sector, but smaller providers, uh, particularly around accessing working capital and finance around taking risk around building their own capability. Um, other issues have been around how far there actually has been genuine innovation, and this has come up in the evaluation that we've been involved in, um, is how far providers have really innovated in the services they offer. Um, and, a, and a third, I suppose, is, that, is how far has that innovation really been shared, because inevitably where providers have done stuff that's good and new, they've wanted to keep that themselves. And there's been a reluctance in the department uh, for work and pensions to really facilitate the sharing of that kind of, certainly at official level, that sort of um, uh, good practice. So I wonder, it, do, do those resonate with you for, for, re, for what, the, what some of the lessons are for rehabilitation and, and, and are there other lessons, positive lessons we can take from, from how, this can, how payment by results in the work program can be improved in, um, in, uh, in rehabilitation? 
I think on the innovation front, I mean, you're absolutely right uh, that some organisations in the work programme have innovated faster than others. And my view is that those that have innovated away from previous models the fastest are ones that are performing better. Um, so it ought to be a no-brainer for them to be challenging and looking at what works best. Um, within, the, within the rehabilitation area, um, I'm expecting one of the key roles of the inspectorate to be to highlight what works well. Um, and also to challenge what doesn't work well. So I think, in a sense, we have a mechanism in place which doesn't exist within the welfare to work area to ensure that best practice is disseminated. You know, this is, of course, it's a competitive world. And of course, people are slightly jealous of their best practice, but we've got to ensure that we have a healthy dose of looking over people's shoulders down the road to see what they're doing to make sure we get the best possible performance. Um, on the small organisation front, look, I'm, I'm acutely aware of this, but I think that there's, there's two things to say. First of all, on the positive proactive side, one of the reasons that I'm making a personal effort, and I've had two personal meetings with the, the social investment sector, is to try to make sure that there is social finance lined up and ready and available for this. Now, it may be that a small organisation isn't big enough to do a, a, an entire contract itself, but there's no reason why a group of four or five charities backed by a social investment organisation can't do that. You know, it, it, to, to a significant degree, although there's private sector participation, that's what's happening in Peterborough. So I'm making a very real effort to do that. But I think my message also, I'm, and I've, I've met representatives of the voluntary sector and said this very clearly, they've got to be more commercial. Because one of the problems with the work programme was small charities signing up to deals they couldn't afford. So I'd done everything I could possibly do. You know, I said, you know, any evidence of firms being used as bid candidate, I'll dump the prime contractor. Um, if big companies treat small companies badly, then I will terminate their contracts. Um, and the Merlin standard gives us clear powers to do that. Um, but all, in all the time I was employment minister, I did not receive one single formal complaint from any organisation about the way they've been treated. But I know, because a lot of them complained to me, that a lot of them had signed up to deals they couldn't afford. Now, with the best will in the world, I can give you all the safeguards that, that, that I can, but if you still sign up to a dumb deal, then there's not a lot I can do about that. And I'm trying to make sure that the representative groups um, for the voluntary sector really work with the sector to ensure that it is commercially savvy in forming partnerships, in doing deals with social investors, or forming private sector partnerships. Okay, take a question at the back, please. And Al Smith, Mr. Grady and I enjoyed your address. I just wanted to ask, you speak about big solutions, and when we talk about a revolution, are we thinking of a real full-scale revolution or a revolution in a teacup? I wonder, when so many governments seem to face the challenge of public opinion and how do they bring people on board to allow them to make these radical decisions and spend the money that's necessary, how committed are you to really communicate in this revolution to the wider public and how are you going to achieve that? Are we talking social campaign, ribbons reminiscent of the, you know, sort of World AIDS Day and breast cancer support to let the public know that we need them on board to re rehabilitate offenders and actually that it benefits us all? <coughs> the next thing I wanted to ask is how radical are you willing to be? Are you willing to consider tax benefits for employers who actively appoint ex-offenders? Mm. Well, on that, that latter point, uh, you're, you're trading back into my old area. I mean, there, is, uh, there, there are clearly measures being taken to provide precisely that kind of support, with the, uh, the youth contract, for example, has been extended to include uh, uh, teenage offenders. So there are some practical incentives there. We will continue to work within the prison system, uh, with employers like National Grid, to create opportunities for people when they leave prison. Uh, and equally, one of the things that I did uh, a couple of years ago now, after we launched the work programme, was to extend it to people leaving prison on day one. Um, so you leave prison, you join the work programme straight away if you're going back onto benefits. Uh, and I want to look at ways in which we create a really joined up structure that starts in prisons, that starts with work in prisons, that starts to involve work programme providers before people leave prison, that operates the rehabilitation support we're talking about in parallel with the work programme after we leave prison, after they leave prison, with a goal of getting people into employment, which I see as crucial. And we've got already in place some incentives to employers to take on young offenders who, uh, uh, who, who uh, need a job. Uh, and you're absolutely right, we've got to engage people. I think the, the, the key is to try and excite people and think people about the role that they can perform uh, in the voluntary sector, uh, whether as volunteers or whether indeed as people look for professional opportunities in the voluntary sector. The, uh, the issue sort of came up in a, in a, in a previous yeah. discussion just before you came in, actually, about there is clearly a, uh, a tension between um, 
wanting to support ex-offenders to find houses, to find a job, and the law-abiding community saying, hold on a minute, I don't get that kind of support to find a house or, yep. or get a job. And I suppose, I, I'm guessing, that perhaps this talk about a revolution in a, in a teacup yep. implies that you're, you're going to have to engage with that. You're going to have to convince the general public, community by community, yep. that actually this is worth it. Well, I hope one of the things, yeah, people see me as being a fairly hardline justice secretary. Um, and I hope that means that actually then when I talk about the importance of rehabilitation that people will listen to me uh, and that people will get a sense that this is something we also have to do. I mean, my view is whether you're the hardest hardliner on crime or the gentlest liberal on crime, we all have an interest in preventing reoffending. And we've got to be willing to stand up in, in our own communities and say, look, we've got to do our bit. And that means accepting the fact that there has to be a role for former offenders, whether it's with employers or with housing, post-prison. Because if we don't do that, then we're just going to see that cycle of reoffending continue. Okay, take some more questions. Uh, yeah, lady there, and then the lady there. Um, Catherine Baxi, Law Society Gazette. I wonder if um, you could allay some fears um, th that I have with, with your contracting with the private sector. And if I can use as an example the contract for court interpreters, um, which went severely pear shaped. That was a, a relatively simple contract for a very discreet. Uh, call centre and booking service. Yet that wasn't piloted adequately, so it had um, very low um, fulfilment rate initially. If that same thing is carried out for your rehabilitation plans, if 40% if, uh, um, of things are not being fulfilled, that's going to have huge uh, ramifications given the, the arena and the people that you're dealing with. Um, secondly, how do you prevent the private sector from cherry-picking those services which they perceive as profitable and leaving the, the s other sectors to um, do the more, more expensive work? Mm -hmm. um, and, and thirdly, um, yeah, you talk about payment by results, but what about penalising those private sector companies who don't achieve the results? Again, to talk, take the ALS contract for interpreters, huge um, failings there by the private company. They've only been penalised £2,000. OK. Um, I could go through a long spiel with you about the interpreter's contract because there were actually issues before that contract as what work was let, not simply as a result of that contract. But look, I mean, in terms of the contract of this, first thing is, I, mean, I have done it before. Uh, and you know, we've, we've, you know, uh, we have been through a big payment by results contracting process, some lessons to learn, but it took place, it took place... Um, uh, over a relatively rapid period, um, certainly rapid by comparison with government contracting. So we have got, as a government, recent experience of delivering payment by results contracts on a large scale. Um, in, in terms of how we ensure that we don't get cherry picking, for example, uh, I, mean, I suppose to start by saying I'm not particularly attracted by a pure prime contractor, subcontractor model for this, um, where you've got a large private company that's coming along just to do a bit of the job. Um, I want to see clear evidence that we've got a joined up team. And of course, single teams. Uh, I, I don't see a situation where we are, you know, we've got three organizations side by side in the same street, um, all doing different things. We could end up with something that's deeply fragmented and deeply disjointed. So what I'm looking for uh, in the bidding process is uh, uh, would be providers who are going to be able to manage the transition for the existing team and you know the day before and the day after it'll be the same people doing the job so we haven't got some great big fall off a cliff moment i then want smart management to make the setup more efficient and more effective so we can start to bring in the under 12 month people um, i want to see a a real mix of expertise being brought to bear on the task and we will establish a pricing system that uh, that is designed to prevent uh, at creaming and parking of any individuals. And indeed, it will not be possible to ignore um, the, the, the most problematic people because there are orders of the court to fulfil and it will be a central part of the contract to do that. That is why this will never be 100% payment by results. Okay. Uh, la lady there. Yep. Good afternoon. Carrie Oliver from G4S. Over the past 10 years or so, about two thirds to three quarters of sentences given out have been fined. Could you address what improvements you want to see in that part of the system? We've not talked about community sentences today. A lot of the focus has been on, um, uh, on uh, uh, people post-prison. Um, it is my desire to also see um, that the, the package that's contracted out will include the de delivery of community payback 
but what I'm also looking to see is uh, a rehabilitation element to go alongside community payback so that it is also about and that, 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 that will include anybody who currently comes under the umbrella of the probation service in the community arena. It won't include people who just get a £100 fine for doing something and sent on their way. But if they currently come into the probation world, then I want to see an element of rehabilitation and life organisation around that. And can I just ask you, since we're talking about the expanse of this, um, when you're looking at those p people under 12 months, yep. the new, the whole new mm -hmm. tranche of, of, of uh, ex-offenders, um, do you uh, are you absolutely certain that you want to mandate that, or, or do you think there should be discretion in terms of you know, some people? It's clearly obvious that they're not going to. Mm -hmm. Well, they're very low, very low risk indeed of reoffending, so you don't really need to have them on the scheme. Or do you see everyone has to be on it? I, I think it's essential that everybody's on it. I think that the providers can form a judgment about the level of intensity of support that is required as long as they are meeting the requirements. What would the sort course. of minimum be, do you think? I mean, is it just, you know, go and see somebody for a 10-minute chat, or is it, or is it more, more, more than that? I, I wouldn't want to be prescriptive if that's one of the things I'm going to be looking at in the, uh, the bids as they come in. Uh, I think there's a minimum requirement. Uh, that has to be there. What we did with the work program, and I'm, I'm minded to think it's the right thing to do as well, is for us to ask providers the question, what is the minimum you will provide of support for everyone? Right. Because what that does is it uh, uh, puts them in a position where they can't just say, this person is too difficult, I will do nothing with them. And if that person doesn't turn up for that conversation, whatever yeah. it turns out to be, or fails, yeah. is there not a risk that you have, you know, the ASBO problem, which everyone sort of ends back up in, in court and ultimately back in jail? Well, I mean, ultimately, for, uh, for some people, that will be the case. Um, if, if people are released from prison today on licence and they flout the conditions... This is license, the whole new bit, that's what I'm yeah. saying. But uh, with the under-12-month people, I mean, it is, to my mind, a complete oddity in our current system that if you go to jail for 13 months, you are released from prison on licence uh, under the supervision of probation, but if you go to prison for 11 months, you're not. Uh, and now that seems to me to be very strange when the under 12 month people have the highest propensity to reoffend. So our intention is to legislate to extend the power to apply license conditions to those under the age of 12 months to require them to participate in the rehabilitation programme. So will it be for the courts then to decide whether there is a license or will all... Will all no, the my intention is that everyone who goes to jail should be subject to this regime. Okay, thank you very much. Um, time perhaps for a couple more questions. Um, have we run out of questions now? <laughs> one there, and sure we have another one. Yeah, uh, yes. And oh, that's your lady there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Hello, um, Francis Toy, uh, Unilink. Um, we do uh, soft prison self service software. Um, to, just picking up on a, a point you made earlier, the Canadians certainly have a, a much lower reoffending rate, and they measure reoffending very much as not a binary thing, but in, in sort of terms of time to reoffend, mm -hmm. so that a prisoner if any other two months versus a year is a very different matter. But I very much, I very strongly believe that rehabilitation begins in, in prison. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, um, do you want to make the prison experience more rehabilitative? And if so, how? And then, assuming that you did want to do that, how do you reconcile the difficulties of a wider public believing in punishment? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, should we take the second, the last question at the same yep. time? Yeah. Have you got your, yes, you yes, please. Uh, Zabra Qureshi, Housing for Women. I was just wondering how far you'd consider a particular specification for women offenders in the overall contract or even indeed whether or not you consider a sort of specialist lot. I think in terms of rehabilitation um, and sorting the life of women out post-prison, I don't see a particular need to try and be prescriptive. There are different needs and challenges, but there are different needs and challenges between different individuals and I hope we'll end up with a more individualised service. But um, in terms of uh, women in prisons, it's an issue we're looking at separately because I, I do recognise that women offenders have a very different set of circumstances to male offenders. Uh, that's one of the reasons I separated the role of Minister for Women in Prisons and Minister for Men in Prisons effectively by uh, Jeremy does men, Helen Grant does wi women and we are looking at the two, two issues separately. Um, but I do recognise the, the, the point you're making. Um, sorry, the, that, that the, 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 the oh yeah, that's fine. What we're also working on is um, I, I want a much more joined up system. I mean, we do have a habit of putting people around the country in all directions in the prison system, not leaving them in one place for long enough to do anything, and then releasing them onto the streets without, uh, if they're short sentence offenders, without, without support. Uh, what we are trying to do is to create a much
structure, uh, and we're looking at ways in which we can uh, align the prison system behind uh, what we're seeking to do in rehabilitation terms. And obviously we're looking more at work in prisons and the nature of the way we, we manage people in prisons with precisely the goals that we're describing. And just on, just on that before, I know you have to go, but just on, on, on prisons, one of the things that we've been talking about is the way in which prisons can practically improve the, the work that they do with somebody, perhaps it's only with them for a relatively short period of time. Can you just very briefly kind of, what, what's your vision? I mean, you've been to a lot of prisons, I'm sure. What, what would be your vision for, for the way that a prison should operate when a, perhaps a, a first time inmate arrives? Well, I mean, ideally, I'd like to see prisons more, a lot of the, 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 the hours, the way of, uh, of living in prisons, more akin to what they're going to expect in the outside world, with a focus on work, a focus on training. Um, and also particularly a, a geographic alignment where we can achieve it. Yes, because that was, I mean, that, in a way, down to you, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. part of the problem is that people come out through the gates of a prison that's actually 200 miles yeah, away from where they live. That's just something we're working on. Good. Work in progress. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris Gray. Thank you very much.